TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. Yes, I know we're a few minutes late due primarily to Anthony's uh, tech problems. Um, <laughs> Anthony can never get anything it, to work right. No, this is actually me because uh, uh, I told people to send questions on Patreon and uh, in the channel memberships community tab. I told people to send questions and I always massively underestimate the time it will take for me to screenshot that, then to incorporate that in, into a, a program where I can actually chop it down to size, a photo program, chop it down to a small size. Then I have to uh, in, import it into Ecamm. Then I have to like, cause Ecamm will just put it big and in the center of the screen. So then I have to make it small and tr try to put it at the bottom of the screen. Anyway, uh, so it ends up taking uh, a few minutes for each one. So then if I have like 30 or 40 questions that I'm uh, doing, it, it it doesn't take the, the half hour or the 45 minutes that I think it will take. And uh, anyway, so that's the that's what happens if you, you go live with Anthony. He screws everything up like that. All right. Um, before we get started, Andrew Elliott said, what video chat app are you using with Anthony? I'm using the program Ecamm as far as me uploading this video to YouTube, uh, we're just, I, I'm just on with Skype. So Ecamm will take, um, will take uh, Skype call as a camera angle. So that's why I use it, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty easy stuff. Um, Breakup Gutby says, can you guys see my chat because the mods always mute me for no reason. Uh, yeah, I see it there. All right, Anthony, how you been doing, man? I've been doing good, good and busy. In fact, tomorrow I'm driving seven hours. I'm probably going past your neck of the woods, but I have to go up somewhere else and uh, preach on Sunday. But uh, definitely very active. All kinds of stuff going on. Why would anyone want a heretic like you preaching? Don't 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 answer. You're gonna have to call someone out for their heresies, and there's gonna be plenty of that during these uh, during these questions. Um, so, Anthony, you've been. You've been going live quite a bit on your channel now. So how's how's that been going? It's going good. So I've actually had the channel, you know, you know that long I've time, had the channel time. for for many years, but I didn't really do anything on it other than there were a few things that I put up uh most of them just sort of humorous uh clips of different things strung together mostly about Islam. But recently, within the past couple of months, I decided to start doing a bunch of live streams. And part of that's because of getting some new equipment. You recall that I was in another house at one point, and I had better lighting. I just had a better setup. We moved here, and now I have everything in my garage, basically. And there's just terrible lighting and all that kind of stuff. So I got lighting. Uh, you sent me the lighting. And... Uh, just other stuff that I needed to, to start doing things. And I thought, hey, why not start doing some live streams? So I did, and I'm going to keep going. Yeah, uh, and, and that's cool. You actually uh, um, looks pretty good with the dark background. Where would you get that idea? I just did this recently. That, 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 that. I know where you got the idea. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I So I have another desk back there. That's where I was doing some of the live streams on my channel and then I moved these this way and I've tried out I've just been trying out a couple of different things to see what it looks like um slam rn says do either of you read german I I took all the way through advanced german in college hmm. never used it ever again um I had to take the german exam uh, for philosophy graduate school, you had to do two languages. So I did uh, German and French. And so basically the test was, here's a passage from Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein, translate it right there. Uh, you know, you have whatever it was, two hours to translate this, uh, this, this passage from Ludwig Wittgenstein. So I passed that, but have not used any of it since then. And I find that I pick up language, languages pretty quickly, but I also forget them really quickly. So I also took all the way through advanced classical Greek, whereas, I mean, I could look at, I look at, I look at Greek now and I'm like, okay, I remember Kai, I remember that, you know, I remember some of these words and stuff, but man, it goes, it goes quickly. How about, how about you, Anthony? I'm assuming you use it more frequently than I do. Your oh, language. Greek, Greek and Hebrew. Yeah. yeah. I, I did have in 
the course of learning theology and so forth, a lot of theology has been done in other languages like German. And so there was a time when I learned a bunch of German theological terms, but I couldn't claim to know the language. I just knew certain terms that were frequently used, like uh, zeitgeist and, and that sort of thing, world, spirit, or ghost. But you mentioned uh, Wittgenstein, and it actually reminded me of a video I wanted to do. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, I think it's the second to last line in his Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus. He says, basically, if you've understood me, he's arguing for the need for a purified language. And he basically says, if you've understood me up to this point, then you realize that all the propositions that I've laid out need to be thrown away once you've used them as a ladder, so to speak, to, to climb up beyond them. Mm-hmm. In other words, if you realize what I'm saying, you realize that the language I use to say it is nonsensical, right? So you, you kind of get to the top by means of a ladder that you later turn around and say is useless. But the reason I think that's such a, a great line is because it reminds me of Islam, because Muslims will argue that the Bible is the word of God. They'll often appeal to the Bible in order to prove that Muhammad's a prophet or other things about Islam. But then they'll turn around and say, you know, this ladder is useless, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So supposedly it's good to get you to Islam. But once you get to Islam, suddenly it's it's corrupted. It's unreliable. Uh, it's got all these perverted stories in it and so forth. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Couldn't possibly have Muhammad predicted in books that talk about people doing terrible things that the Bible condemns, but Muhammad approved. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Wittgenstein is one of the, he's one of the few philosophers who, not sure quite how to put this, he's one of the few philosophers where if he didn't come up with, with his theories, no one else would have, right? Uh, Kant is like that, right? No one would have come mm-hmm. up with, no one would have come up with Kant apart from Kant, right? Whereas, whereas lots of others, you know, if you're talking about Descartes and Hume and Locke and all these guys, um, if they hadn't come up with it, someone would have come up. It's like calculus. If, if Newton and Leibniz hadn't come up with calculus, well, mathematics had just developed up to the point where it's waiting for people to, you know, take it a, take it a step further and so on. Whereas these guys were just completely, completely different from, from everyone else. Um, all right. So, oh, here's one. Here's one you'll like, Anthony. Renee said, Check out Shabir's public response against Ijaz. It appears Ijaz no longer works for Shabir's ministry. And the only reason I bring this up is you're you're debating Shabir in November, aren't you? Yep, November 14th. And you're supposed to be there for the same event. Not oh, I keep debate. forgetting that. I keep forgetting that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, so you, Jay Smith, and Eddie Dalcor and who, who knows who else, but uh, that's supposed to take place November 14th, which I think is a Saturday. And so Shabir and I are going to be debating two topics. One's on the Trinity. Is the Trinity biblical? The other is going to be on Tawhid. Is Islamic monotheism pure? Mm-hmm. I think is the way he wanted to frame the question. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be debating that topic. Uh, and Shabir, as you mentioned, has apparently distanced himself from Ijaz because Ijaz's Ijaz's antics apparently uh, are something he finds uh, not up to snuff. So do not do not reflect well upon Shabir, who Shabir's uh, Shabir can get a little hot tempered, but he would he would never go he would never go that route. So yeah, uh, Ijaz is one of the latest meltdowns that the the more mature generation of Muslim apologists generally wouldn't go that route, but the younger generation is is losing their minds and falling apart. Um, all right, so ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna we're gonna take questions. And again, I told people, uh, you know, I told people on uh, in channel memberships and on Patreon to uh, send us questions. We have some questions from uh, from from uh, Anthony's uh, Anthony's subscribers and so on. And we'll also take questions from the chat. So I'll probably kind of jump around. Um, question from here, question from there, and so on. Uh, but here's here's one that, that needs to be addressed. David Wood reupload says, question, why are you running away from the mighty Minj? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's too powerful, right? It's uh, His arguments are too airtight. Ijaz is basically the Sam Shamoon of Islam, right? No one wants to, <laughs> no one wants to, to, to deal with him. He's too, his, his intellect is too, is too powerful. Um, the other reason 
The other reason I might run away from men is because I have children. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's messed up. <laughs> well, and, and if you were going to go chasing him, then you'd have to chase him into to prison. Uh, yeah. Although he's not there officially yeah. yet, I guess. But we don't we don't uh, even know we don't even know what the rules are in uh in Malaysia. Uh, they might be laid back, you know. And my like, eh, okay, okay. The girls you're looking, I don't know what he was looking at, but I mean, there, there might be a difference. Oh, you're looking at girls who are nine. That's okay. But if he's looking at, you know, boys who are three, then they might have a problem. I don't know what, I don't know what the rules are over there. There's some mm. sick stuff. All right. All right, Anthony, you ready to take some questions? I'm ready. Now I have not, some of the questions that I have that I pulled up from my channel members and patrons and so on. I did not show Anthony these questions ahead of time, so we might actually stump him because some of them stump are him. questions for him. Some of them are like, you know, some questions are like lighthearted and others are, uh, explain this, morons. <laughs> we'll see. All right. So matter of fact, let me pull up, let me pull up, uh, let me pull up one that you sent over to me. Um, here you go. Islam critiqued. I want to know why you're both still producing videos. When you know you're both finished, boy. <laughs> Do you have an answer for that, Anthony? <laughs> well, I, I told uh, Islam critiqued that uh, although hijab still is, uh, you know, going through the motions of spitting, his spitting days were over when I spit my rap some time back. If you recall, that was a that was a career-ending rap. Hijab hasn't. Uh, tried to rap since then so anybody who doubts my superior rapping skills simply has to take notice he hij hijab is no longer rapping so that's my answer yeah um as for me i'm just uh I'm just in it for the money you know what i mean <laughs> what, what do you want me to do I can't I can't step out the game when these dudes are making me rich <laughs> <laughs> all right let me take uh quick... and, and, and i have to add for those that don't get david's humor and so forth david is the last person on earth as he said in fact a couple of years ago that's gonna uh swim in money like scrooge mcduck uh david will pour all of this money into the cause of christ and his kingdom uh there should be no question about that I'm a first-hand uh, witness to so many of the things that he does, some of which he doesn't say. So rest assured, David is working tirelessly in the cause of Christ. Wow, weird to have someone speak out for me. Because <laughs> people, because there, there are lots of people who can't tell when we're joking, right? So like someone here, wait, oh, Sam said something about Anthony. Oh, oh, are Sam and Anthony at war? <laughs> <laughs> and so when they see me sitting here like this, they don't get. Hey, it's just to it's just to annoy it's just to annoy some people who are trying to get me, you know, get us de demonetized and so on and so I'm kind of thrown it in their faces. But uh, yeah, all right. So n the next question I had up, um, this one will be for me. Daniel Apologetic said, "Dear Dizzle the Artist, it's a good name." Norway loved episode one of the Apologetics Empire. When do you think Muslim apologists will stop throwing you so many bones? so that you can continue the project. Uh, Daniel Apologetics, uh, unless something goes horribly, horribly wrong, um, we will be starting, uh, g getting back to that here in uh, in the next couple of weeks, no matter what happens, no matter what happens with Muslim uh, apologists. So just to give you an idea of my process, um, if, if I think that something is important enough to be sidetracked for a while, I'll be sidetracked for a while, but the way I'll do it is I'll focus on that for a while until until it's normal and I've got everything covered. And then I can kind of incorporate that moving forward. In other words, in other words, now that I've kind of jumped all over this stuff and things calm down, they're still going to be, they're still going to be, uh, they're still going to be in meltdown mode, but they're going to be a little more careful. So it's going to be coming out more slowly. So I can still go after them for their antics and meltdowns, but I can get back to apologetics. I will probably post an awesome apologetics video that I've been working on here in the next uh, in the next few days. Um, it's going to be top ten myths Muslims believe about Islam, and uh, yes, again, unless something 
goes horribly, horribly wrong, like a nuclear meltdown or something like that, then we'll be getting back to the apologetics empire stuff uh, next month. And uh, fortunately, fortunately, these Muslim apologists are funding the entire empire. How cool is that? I think it's cool. I, I love that kind of stuff. <laughs> All right. Is uh, is two here for Anthony? Um, hey, here's a... It's cool because we have different people ask completely different kinds of questions here. Um, so I am an ex-Muslim says, question, how does one effectively juggle having a full-time job and also have an ex-Muslim ministry at the same time? How does one do this effectively? How do you keep the balance between family life and the ministry? So notice there, there, are, there are three things there. There's one, you have a full-time job. Two, you have a ministry. You're focused on ministry. And three, you also have to balance all of that with family. So situations, I mean, Anthony, you're probably, you're perfect for this because for years you were working a job and doing apologetics. Then you got into school and you're doing school and working and apologetics. And you've got your, you've got your family. So you're doing a lot of stuff. So why don't you give some advice there? Yeah. So one thing is, and you know, my situation it's changed over time, but I've always been busy. But especially since I got into seminary back in 2014, I graduated in 2018, but it's it's continued in a similar way since then. But while I was in seminary, I was working full time, going to school full time, and I was trying to learn Hebrew, Greek and so forth. And I also have a family, of course. And my wife was working part time while also homeschooling our kids. But then my youngest got sick. She has a protracted illness. <clears throat> so my wife had to take care of her full time, which meant I had to take on an additional full time job. And eventually that didn't pay enough to cover all of our expenses. So I had to have three full time jobs. Now, I'm not going to try and explain how all of that possibly work together. Somebody says, how do you work three full time jobs? There's only 24 hours in a day and go to school and do homework and learn things. Well, Happily, I've always been sort of, I'm, I'm not like OCD, um, except in a few ways. One is, I'm like Mr. OCD when it comes to trying to determine the best order in which to do things and the best way to maximize the time that I have, right? So, for example, if I have five things that I'd like to do in a day, I think, what things can I do simultaneously, Right. So, for example, let's say I want to uh, listen to a lecture on something. I also know I need to mow my lawn. Right. I'll immediately think, oh, I'm going to listen to that while I'm mowing my lawn. Right. That automatically takes care of one thing while I'm taking care of the other thing. So I just think of all sorts of creative ways. When I, I worked at a, um, a warehouse while going to seminary and I used to have to run around the warehouse getting items to ship out to people. And I would line up the cart. They were these, uh, these stacked up, these carts, and you could put stuff on the top row, and then you could uh, put other items on the bottom rows. So I would lay out a bunch of Hebrew and Greek stuff on my, on my cart and run around the building looking over at the papers while gathering items. I, I just found all sorts of ways, creative ways, to try and do things like that. Uh, I had CDs and things I would play in my car while I was driving. Every moment was an occasion to do more than one thing in my mind. So that's that's one thing. And that also meant that if I was taking care of some of my studies while working, then I had more time when I got home to spend with my family. Um, you know, so those are some of my suggestions. The other thing that I recommend to people is work ahead, right? If you work ahead, then it takes a lot of pressure off when things come up, right? If you, for example, I, I know pastors who, uh, I, I remember one pastor telling me that his wife said to him once, you know, you're not a lot of fun to be around on Saturdays. And that's because he was normally in a crunch, right? He's sitting there thinking, I've got to figure out the rest of what I'm going to say on mm -hmm. Sunday. And uh, so he decided he was going to start being more prepared. And and that's especially important for a pastor because you never know when some terrible thing could happen. And you definitely have to focus on that, right? Mm -hmm. There could be a death in the congregation. Anything could happen. And what do you do? Say, no, i got to finish my sermon? Or do you go and minister to the person? Well, if you had prepared in advance, let's say you prepared your sermons a month out, at least doing all the necessary preparation, uh, jotting down notes, making an outline, basic things like that, well, then you can 
be at ease if something happens to disrupt your expectations. So those are some of my suggestions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Anthony is uh, obviously better at being prepared and uh, time management than I am. I would normally I would normally deal with having too much to do by not sleeping. Uh, so I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend that. So I'd be like, no problem. I'll just get three three hours sleep tonight, or or no sleep tonight in order to in order to get that. It's not a good not a good long term solution. But yeah, I would do something similar where um, where I would try to get a little bit of work done throughout the day as far as like a little bit of ministry work done during the day if I'm if I'm working. So I would I would carry around little little notepads and stuff like that in my pocket so that as I'm as I'm working, if I now I'm full time I'm full time now. This, this is what I do now is full time, but but back in the day. Um, if I had schoolwork to do while I was working, or if I was working on an article, you know, on apologetics like that or something like that, and I was working, keep a little notepad in my pocket. And anytime I'm doing something and jot down an idea, guess what? By the time I'm done work for the day, I have an entire outline and some awesome wicked quotes that I've, that I've come up with, uh, on my notepad. And so it makes it a lot easier to, to work on the article there. Apart from that, I just say, you know, just, just figure out, figure out how much time you've got for something like ministry. If you can only do something you know on weekends or part of the day on weekends then that's that that's fine if you can only if you only can spare a half hour or an hour a day or something like that you can get a lot done if you're consistent with that so i mean you get a lot done just by you know answering some emails or or commenting or um, talking to someone so yeah you could get it done all right uh, a couple questions from the chat here here's a here's a super chat nicholas said Christian and Islamic eschatology are eerily similar. Have you compared the Antichrist with the, the Mahdi, um, false prophet with the Muslim Jesus, Dajjal with the true Christ? Weird. Yeah, so th there are basically two things here. One, and, and Anthony can expand upon all this. One, um, Islam drew on Jewish and Christian teaching. So it, it's no surprise that we find similarities and using some of the same terms and so on. So uh, Muhammad clearly incorporated all kinds of things from beliefs and from groups that were already around. Uh, but yes, there, there looks like there seems to be something demonic <laughs> as well with the way these things get incorporated. So what are your thoughts on this, Anthony? Well, what, what I find more interesting, he said there's a comparison between Islamic eschatology with respect to something like the Dajjal and Antichrist. But I find uh, it interesting that whenever the Hadith talk about the Dajjal, the comparison that is made, and really a contrast too, but is between the Dajjal and Allah, right? Because um, what, what the uh, Hadith say, and actually I just pulled up a few, uh, this is from Sunan Abu Dawood, it says the Dajjal is one-eyed, but Allah is not one-eyed, right? So the, the Hadith repeatedly want to make this distinction. This is how you can tell this is the Dajjal, and no, it's not Allah, right? Because Dajjal only has one eye, as opposed to Allah, who has two, right? Now, you know how devastating that is to Islam, because they claim Christians are guilty of deifying a man, even though we don't say that a man became God, we say that the eternal God, who is not a man, did, in the fullness of time, take on himself a human nature, right? That's a very different idea. Uh, he's not a man in terms of his eternal divinity. He took on a human nature. However, Allah, according to the Islamic sources, does have apparently human features, including eyes, too, unlike the Dajjal. But yeah, like you said, the, the Islamic sources are uh, basically getting certain things from Jews and Christians. Now, it's interesting, there's actually a push in some Islamic uh, circles to sort of rework their view of eschatology. I don't know if you've been watching Mufti Abu Layth, our favorite laughing sheikh, uh, but he's been talking about a guy who's actually going through and critiquing these hadith narrations regarding uh, the return of Jesus and mm -hmm. other things and actually calling into question because, of course, the Quran doesn't clearly state that Jesus is returning, does it? In fact, the Quran seems to have certain things confused. You could tell they're coming from the Bible, but 
they're like they're, they're very ambiguous or incoherent as they stand in the Quran. Like the Quran talks about the beast, mm-hmm. but it's it's a very brief comment, and you almost wonder: is this a positive thing or is it a negative? What is this talking about here? And so the Quran itself isn't very helpful when it comes to Jesus. Uh, there's no clear reference to him returning in the Quran. Uh, so if the Hadith can be called into question, then you know, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that there are Muslims who are calling this into question, just like they're calling into question the holes in the narrative of the tra- uh, Quran's transmission. So no surprise there. Yes, we are uh, we are witnessing the complete breakdown of all things Islamic in our lifetimes. And man, it's fun to watch. Um, here's a different kind of question. Again, it's, uh, it's cool that questions are in totally different directions. Uh, did so said, I don't want to sound ignorant, but I am dying to know where are the 12 disciples now, according to the Bible. So I guess that's a, I guess that's a question of like, I'm assuming it is of, uh, like, do you go into a sleep or are you with the, with the Lord? I I guess it's that, Mm. but uh, Anthony, where do you think the 12 disciples are right this second? They are with Christ, and Paul himself actually addressed all 12? that. When, all 12? All, oh, yeah. All, well, it depends what you mean by the 12. Obviously, the term 12. Oh, every last one of the original 12 disciples is with Jesus right now. Is that Anthony Rogers' firm position? <laughs> so the term, the 12, comes to be a technical term just to refer to the band of disciples. But, of course, Judas was destined to destruction, right? He's re- referred to as the son of perdition, the one uh, that was marked out for that uh, and even foretold in the Psalms. So Jesus, according to John 6, called him a devil even before he apostatized. Uh, John 13 tells us that Judas was, uh, you know, secretly sticking his hand in the money bag all along, even though the other disciples were ignorant. And, of course, he betrayed the Lord Jesus. You know, it's interesting in all references to Judas— uh, it never mentions Judas without saying the one who betrayed him, right? <laughs> uh, of course, there's another Judas he's being distinguished from, but uh, how would you like having your name in the Bible and it's always associated with uh, this lowest of all you know, possible sins? Um, we, we should start branding people like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, like Hater Wood. Yeah, right? Hater Wood. That's funny because Sam started doing that because uh, in case anyone doesn't uh, go on... Uh, Sam's live streams, which is most people, because most people would be bored to death on Cheers. Sam's live stream. Right. But uh, I would just go over there and troll, and I make some slick comment, and I, then I'd leave. And he would call me Haterwood, Haterwood, the the <laughs> dictator, blah blah blah. But then I started noticing everywhere people are calling me Haterwood, and so that's like Sam's like thirty fans. They all <laughs> run around calling me Haterwood now. So you can brand people like that. Um, yeah. So. Uh... We actually got sidetracked, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, so, so Jesus, first of all, said to the thief on his right, remember, in Luke 23, 43, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then in verse 46, Jesus said, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. So there you have an indication that the righteous who die go to be with the Lord. Um, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7 said as he was about to die when they were about to stone him he said he he saw the heavens open he saw jesus there standing at the right hand of god and he said uh you know forgive them lord right and then he said uh receive my spirit so stephen fully expected for his spirit to be received by the lord jesus and that's basically old testament teaching as well ecclesiastes 12 7 says the the body returns to the dust but the spirit returns to god who gave it but i i mentioned paul and, and that's because Paul said in Philippians 1, uh, he's, he's dealing with the issue of you know the, the prospect of his death, which was always a possibility in terms of outward circumstances. People wanted to kill him. And he's looking at these alternatives. Well, do I live or die? Which do I choose? Which do I want? And he said, you know, both have their, their, their advantages, right? If I, if I remain on in the flesh, it means more service to Christ, uh, greater benefit to his church. But if I die, it means going to be in the presence of Christ. And so he says, uh, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. 
Uh, and so then, then Paul goes on. So Paul made it very clear that if he died, he would depart to be with Christ. And you, you have this all over the New Testament. It's, it's remarkable to me how Unitarians that I've been interacting with just, you know, balk at this idea. Because, again, I mean, it's so frequent. Um, in, in Revelation 5, for example, one, one last example, uh, you have the souls of those who were beheaded for their testimony to, to the Lord Jesus. And, and they're crying out in heaven, right? They're crying out, saying, How long, holy and true, uh, Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood? So the the martyred saints are crying out for vengeance. Uh, so, uh, again, I mean, the, the idea that people cease to exist isn't found in the Bible. Uh, it does use the term sleep, but notice it's not. It's only talking about the righteous, and the I- idea is that they are at rest, right? Their bodies are interred in the ground, like a person sleeping, and they also are resting from their labors, their toils in this world. But they're at peace with Christ and experiencing the joy of Christ. All right, Ditto. Hope that answers the question. And uh, this is actually uh, this is actually perfect because earlier <laughs> earlier I mentioned that people don't always know when we're joking, <laughs> and then so. We see other people start making fun of Sam. So Prophet Google here said, uh, <laughs> Sam's been stuck on 30,000 subs for five years. He blocked 200,000. <laughs> so, but, but, then, but, then, but, then, but then after that, because of what I was saying, I was saying Sam's boring live streams. Uh, Brady said, do David and Sam not get along? Or is he joking? Now, someone already corrected him, he already, so he already knows. But uh, yeah, uh, guys, get, get it through your mind. We all attack each other constantly and make fun of each other constantly. Uh, you're witnessing the the inside of a locker room a men's locker room yeah but uh, uh wait, wait say- al Khan al Haq gives a good rule right here before we lose it when in doubt assume david is joking that is a good principle <laughs> go ahead go ahead anthony <laughs> yeah I, I was just gonna say that sam's uh subscribers it's it's like a a you know pool with a leak or something you know if you're if you're constantly putting fresh water into it and it's leaking it looks like it's staying at the same level uh, but really, it's just because there's an influx of new subscribers while the old ones are being banished and sent to the hinterlands. Yeah, actually, uh, in, in Sam's defense, it was it was like several months ago. He had like 10,000 and now he's up to 30,000 doing mm. just doing lives, just doing live streams. So somehow that is working out for him. I guess there are people in the world who Ambien just doesn't work, right? They can't fall asleep. So they tune into Sam. Bam, <laughs> Sam puts them right to sleep. And they, they keep coming back, right? They subscribe, uh, they click the bell because they know every night I can't get to sleep. I turn on Sam and then bam, I'm out. I'm out like three strikes. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's uh, go back to questions Anthony sent me. So Gerard Perry said, do you have to, <laughs> this is an easy one. Gerard Perry says, do you have to spend time in the pen to be an accomplished apologist? If so, how many years? How many years do you think, Anthony? So just so people know, they already know that you were in prison. I know some people know that I was. I was converted in prison as an 18-year-old kid. I think I was about 19 when I was converted, but I went in when I was 18, about to turn 19. And, you know, I I was a thug. I ran on the streets of uh, California, uh, gangbanging, other things. So I was converted in prison. I spent two and a half years. I was sentenced to something like seven and a half for three different charges, two of which were concurrent. One was consecutive. Um, and I'm actually grateful for the time I spent in prison. That was, I, I'm that was, that was the most important time of my entire life up until, right. yeah, definitely up until then. And probably yeah. since then too. There, there's all sorts of benefits from that. That it, It's not as if, David or I are saying, give us the choice right now and we'll say, let's go to prison. No. Now, I'd both rather, of us I would, would say, I would rather be out here. Yeah. Both of us would say if somebody, you know, told us we had to stop proclaiming Christ or something like that, or you go to prison, we'd still go to prison. Right. I mean, it's not like that's what we're saying. But but um, but we can look back and say, man, that was a blessing because I had uninterrupted time to study the Bible. Uh, I'll give you an example of just how significant it was for me. I know, I'll bet you the vast majority of Christians couldn't claim to have read the entire Bible, right? I, When I became a believer, I had only read two books in my entire life. 
I read two books in my entire life before I went to prison, James and the Giant Peach and The Call of the Wild, right? And I basically cheated every year in school prior uh, to my conversion uh, by using one of those books that I had already read as a book report for the next year. So I always pretended like I was reading when I wasn't. And that only worked so far, right? Because you had to increase the level of, uh, uh, right, the books See, you were reading. So you're in, you're in, you're in, you're in, you're in twelfth grade. And you're like, uh, here's my report on on James and the Giant Peach. <laughs> no, the, the way so the way I got around some of that was either I would use a book the teacher read in class because mm-hmm. in my school they would they would read a book. I would watch. The, I'd to... watch the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you watch the movie and hope that you don't say something that they changed or whatever but um so i went into prison and i was in well first i went to jail so i'm in jail going through the court system and all of that before my conviction and i actually this is this is funny the only reason i started reading a bible i had no interest in reading a bible i was put in a a jail cell with a self-professed devil worshiper and he was a nice guy, surprisingly. You know, he claimed to be a devil worshiper. He was a nice guy. And because I had a Sicilian, I'm, I'm Sicilian, so my family's background was Roman Catholic. So if somebody asked me, what's your religion? I would say Christian, right? And so, I, but I didn't know a thing about the Bible. I didn't believe I wasn't converted or anything like that. That's just what I would have said. So he asked me and I said that, and he had an ax to grind against Christianity. So he started doing things like he drew a pentagram above my bed so I'd look up and see it, right? He just did all this crazy stuff. And then he would tell me stuff about the Bible, and he told me how to get a Bible, to write a kite and, and request a Bible, because he was going to show me all these terrible things. And so he ended up getting me this Bible and couldn't find the stuff that he wanted to show me. And so I thought, well, what the heck? I don't have anything else to do. I'll start reading this thing, right? So I started reading it, and it terrified me, right? I'm reading stories of uh, God deluging uh, the world in a flood and only sparing eight people. Uh, then I read about the ground opening up and swallowing whole families alive, fire shooting out of God's presence when people offered unauthorized fire, right? I'm hearing all these terrible things, and I'm thinking, I used to think I was unstoppable. Nobody could stop me because I got away with everything. I mean, I, it wasn't like I didn't start committing crimes till I was 18. I was doing it almost my entire life. I was I was being brought home by the police when I was six years old, right? Stealing bikes, breaking windows, whatever it was. I, I just, I was, a, you know, I was, uh, th- the book of Job says that the wicked go astray from the womb as surely as the sparks fly upward, right? I mean, I went astray from the womb. So anyways, I, uh, I just thought I was unstoppable. And then uh, so I'm in prison and I'm reading about, uh, you know, this God who has all of heaven and earth at his disposal. And I thought, if I got caught by men, what do I, what makes me think I'm going to escape this God, right? And that just terrified me. But my point was that, so while I was there in the jail for two months, I read the entire Bible from cover to cover. Then I was convicted, officially convicted in court. I was sent to the fish tank at the prison where you have to be quarantined for like a month. David knows this well. Uh, I'm assuming it was similar for you. So first you're quarantined for like a month before they release you to the general population where you're with the rest of the prisoners. And in quarantine, you're only allowed out for like an hour a day to take a shower, work out or something like that. So I was in a cell for 23 hours a day for a whole month without any yard time, none of that kind of stuff. So I read the Bible again, right? And then I'm, I'm put out onto the yard, and even though you get some yard time, there's still a lot of lockdown time. You have to be locked in your cell for, I don't remember what the hours were, but maybe 16 hours a day. And I just had time. I had time galore. And so I just, I read the Bible. Uh, people were sending me books. I had no more time to read the Bible than I ever I've ever had in my life. And so even though I've continued to read since then, you know, it's it's never as easy as it was. So, mm. yeah, similar uh, similar experience. And in fact, uh, yeah. So you find out very quickly that once you get locked up, you don't have all of the same distractions that you had before. Uh, especially if you end up in a cell for a while, you end up with a lot of time to think, a lot of time to read, and so on. But um, I don't know if you had the uh, same uh, experience, Anthony. But so. Obviously, a lot of the same things applied when I was locked up, uh, spent years 
reading multiple hours per day and so on. Uh, but when I got out, I, I recognized very quickly, man, it is way harder, way harder out here to stay on track than it was in prison. And I was, you know, trying to figure out why that was for, for a while. And it's just, well, you know, there's so many more things to distract you out there. I was thinking something along those lines. But then I was actually listening to Gary Habermas, uh, over at Mike Lacona's house. And he was talking about the disciplines. And then, you know, he pointed me towards uh, books by Dallas Willard and Richard Foster and so on on the disciplines. And, and what that means, everyone, is is basically if you ask someone, if you ask a Christian today, what are the disciplines of Christianity? The, 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 the things that you, you know, the things that a, a Christian uh, should be doing as part of his spiritual life. You'll get, you know, prayer, uh, Bible study, fellowship. You'll, 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 you'll get a small handful of them. Whereas Dallas Willard and Richard Foster, they point out that if you if you go back to the early church, it was more like more like twelve to fifteen um, important Christian disciplines. And what's crazy is you can go back and look in the Bible and they're right there, right? So mm. uh, solitude that was a, that was an early Christian discipline. You're supposed to take periods of time when you focused on just being uh, alone, right? Um, simplicity simplicity trying to live as simple a life as possible frugality so these are things that that you see them in the bible you see christians doing them but they're not they're not emphasized and so i realized that in prison you have a lot of, you end up with a lot of those disciplines kind of imposed on you because of your situation right you're living a very simple life you know you 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 have to wake up at a certain time uh you have to make your bed uh you you know you've got laundry but pretty you know, you have your jail, your prison job, you do that, then you read for a while, then you go work out, then you read some more and so on. And it's you know, the same thing over and over again. So it's very simple. Life. You don't have a lot of stuff. All the stuff you have fits on your little headboard or, or in your foot locker. So very, very simple life, very frugal life, right? You might, you know, I might buy a few things off canteen and so on, but you're not, you're not making big money decisions in there and so on. And so lots of the early, lots of the disciplines of Christianity are, are part of your life. And then all of a sudden, all that's gone. You walk out the door of the prison, all that's gone. And so, um, yeah, well, well, back to the question, do you have to spend time in the pen to be an accomplished apologist? <laughs> we know, we, we, we know you're joking, Gerard. Um, but I think Anthony and I will both say, if you're focused on it, it definitely helps because you're never going to have that kind of uh, opportunity with so few distractions to really become grounded in in apologetics. Yeah, and obviously there are great apologists out there that spent no time in the prison, right? I don't know about <laughs> I don't know about great. There are some okay apologists who didn't spend time right. in prison. <laughs> and and they might have been great if had they gone to prison. Yeah, they would have been much greater, right? They would have been right. much greater if they'd been locked up with us. <laughs> All right. Another question from the batch you sent, uh, and this because I saw uh, I saw the same question right here um, in the chat. So same question was in the chat right here was also sent to you. So RK the counter cult says I have two simple questions simply because I'd like to hear your take on them. One, what is the best succinct response to the common nonsensical objection to the Trinity? that God cannot be three persons without being three gods. I've heard many respond to this the same way I thought to, namely that God's nature is not fully comprehensible, but I haven't been intellectually satisfied with this for some reason. Uh, I am aware that this is a philosophical question rather than a biblical one, as the Bible answers the what question, philosophy often answering the how. I only see one here. Did you chop, his, did you chop off yeah. his second question? Yeah, I did because it's. Oh, it, uh, I could tell you what it is, but because I you're scared it of it. No, because you said it was about Zoroastrianism, but okay. because you said to try and you know make it smaller. Oh, it make it so covered, it would fit on the screen. Yeah, yeah, it would, it would have covered your ugly face, which might have been a good idea. But um, yeah, so uh, one one question per customer. No. Um, so yeah, I mean. Just looking back over this to make sure I'm sure exactly what you're asking. So, so the, when, the, the, the yeah, basically the objection 
Um, if God's a trinity, then how's that possible unless God is three gods? Right. So when, when my, my view, and this is the Western view of, of Christendom, I mean, it's the Orthodox view of Christianity that has prevailed uh, throughout the centuries, uh, is that the persons of the Trinity are numerically identical in their essence, but numerically distinct as to their person, uh, their personhood, right? So it, there, a lot of people, when they think of the Trinity, in fact, they'll illustrate it this way, and it's just not correct. Uh, it, it's not that people are intending to communicate a heretical notion, but the illustration falls short. But they'll think of the persons of the Trinity as kind of like a pie, right, that's cut up into thirds, right? So the, the Son is one-third of God, the Father is one-third of God, and the Spirit is one-third of God. But the Bible doesn't teach that. And that isn't how we would express the theology of the Bible philosophically. Rather, what we would say is that Scripture presents each person as the fullness of deity, meaning all three persons possess the full divine nature. And it's the same nature, precisely because Scripture says there's only one God, right? There's not multiple gods. The persons of the Trinity are not a unity of, of gods or beings uh, that somehow function in harmony. Rather, they're portrayed as one God. And so uh, the way this has been expressed in the theological-philosophical way is to say that they are numerically identical as to their essence, right? So the, the essence of the Father is the essence of the Son, is the essence of the Spirit. It's not a part of the essence that the Son possesses. It's the entirety of the essence which is possessed alike by the Father and the Spirit. So to say this another way that might be helpful, what, what people often think of is, if you think of human beings, right, David and I and you and everybody listening, we're all human beings. We have the same kind of nature, but we're not numerically identical, right, in our nature. I possess, I'm a different, to use platonic terms, I'm a different instantiation of humanity than David, right? Uh, David's a different instantiation of humanity than I am. So we have the same kind of nature, but they're not numerically identical. The, the the substance that makes up me is not the substance that makes up David. Yeah, However, guys, guys, are, well, are you uh, slow it down a little bit? Guys, are you are you getting that there? So, Anthony, you're pointing out that we have we have the same human nature in the sense that we're both fully human beings, but not numerically the so we're not the exact same human nature. We're different in as you call them instantiations of human nature, right? So we, we, we both share human nature, the one human, the one, you know, whatever, whatever human nature is, we both share that. We're kind of different examples of that. And how is that going to be different from the Trinity? Yeah, so in the case of the Trinity, the persons do not have, they're not different instantiations in the sense that, uh, the sun has the same kind of substance, but it's numerically different from the substance of the Father. He is the same God as the Father, right? Think, think for example, of Colossians 2.9. Colossians 2.9 says, In Christ dwells all the fullness of deity in bodily form. It doesn't say a part of the deity. In fact, Paul's language here is so strong. All Paul had to say was, In Christ dwells deity in bodily form, right? And anybody who knows that God can't be divided, right? God is not made up of parts, would understand that Christ is the entirety of divinity. But Paul says that he is the fullness of deity, and he doesn't just say the fullness of deity, he says all the fullness of deity. He's, he's, make, he's piling up phrases here and making it very clear that Jesus is the entirety of what it is to be God. And so, given that there's only one God, and Christ is all that there is to deity— then the persons of the Trinity are numerically identical as to their essence. So the, the unity of the persons goes beyond merely a harmony of wills, uh, a consent between the persons, uh, a cooperation or anything like that. They are fundamentally one in their being, but distinct in their personhood. Okay. Now, this is where the, the mystery isn't how can they both be one, um, or how, how can they all be one, right, and that not be three gods. The issue is, I mean, this is there's no logical issue here, right? Uh, a lot of people confuse logic with 
you know, what, 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 what people mean often when they say something is irrational or something like that is it goes beyond my experience, mm -hmm. right? I don't know any other being like that. Well, okay, yep. fine, right? Uh, I don't know any other being who's infinite, eternal, and unchangeable either, right? But I don't then say God doesn't exist because I have no other reference point for that. Uh, so likewise, I mean, there's no logical contradiction in the notion of God being one in three in the ways I described, though it does go beyond our experience. And I don't think any Muslim should ever raise this as an objection, you know, and, and actually you don't really hear Muslims saying that uh, it's incomprehensible. They do try and say it's irrational, right? Yeah. But they don't try and say it's, it's wrong because it's incomprehensible, because surely the Quran says something about God being unlike everything, doesn't mm -hmm. it? <laughs> Right, mm -hmm. uh, Surah forty two eleven, Surah yeah, one twelve four, they, they, and they they don't always they don't always get that. I mean, I've seen uh, Yusha Evans. I told Christian, show me so show me something like the Trinity. Point point to something like the Trinity. I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> the Quran says nothing's like God. So why are you saying show me something? Show me something like that. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's my basic answer. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Easy question here. Jack Nicholson. Yes, the Jack Nicholson says, what did Anthony go to prison for? Car theft. Right. Is that right, Anthony? Am I right on that? Stealing yeah, cars. So, so the there were actually three charges that kind of happened around the same time. You know how you if you get arrested the first time, they usually let you out on an OR, your own recognizance. And since I didn't have a record prior to the first incident, I was let out and then I got in trouble again. But since I had not gone to court on that first one yet, I hadn't officially had nothing was decided on that first one. They let me out again and I got in trouble again. This that one was the the, the third time was for having a gun. Um, my brother, who is another thug, got in an argument with somebody at a 7-Eleven and I pulled out the gun. So the gang unit pounced on us and carted me off to jail. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't pop a cap in anyone, did you? No. Good, 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 good. Uh, here you go, Anthony Isaac S said, uh, David, please ask Anthony the meaning of right hand of the Father. Yeah, so it's a, it's an idiomatic term that simply refers to the position of authority. You know, e even, even among men, when it talks about one person being at the right hand of somebody, it doesn't necessarily mean they're literally at their right hand, right? If I talk about, if David says that Anthony is his right-hand man, it doesn't mean I'm literally at David's right hand. It just means that I'm somebody who helps him. I'm, I'm an especially important person to what he does. Um, but uh, so that's why you even have scripture sometimes saying it varies the expression. Sometimes it'll say at the right hand of power, right? It doesn't, is power literally a thing? No, that's a idiomatic way of referring to God. And so it's it's not to be understood literally as if God has a hand, and it's not to be understood literally as Jesus necessarily occupying one position and his feet never moving, right? Like he, he's, he's in heaven. In fact, sometimes Scripture says standing, sometimes sitting, right? I mean, there's other ways it states it, and all it's intending to communicate is that he's in the position of highest authority. All right, let's see. Um... Uh, matter of fact, let's do a couple of these uh, from Patreon here. David Cruz said, uh, when I was a Muslim, you was doing a series of videos called Islamic Facts. Those videos make me research about Islam, uh, find the trust, uh, find the, I think, truth there, find the truth. And then finally, uh, apostatize. Would you consider making them again and extend all those topics not addressed on previous videos? So I think he's referring to that. You remember that fun Islamic Facts series? I think I did 20 of those, and it was uh, that was back when there were terror. It seemed like there were terrorist attacks every almost every day or every couple days or something like that. So I started saying that uh, every time uh, there would be a terrorist attack, I'd I'd make a video get, sharing a fun Islamic fact. But uh, yeah, I got through I think 20, and so I could possibly start it up again at some point. It, it's going to have to basically be a string of terrorist attacks that I, you know, and I want to start making fun of the the terrorists. Well, the ideology of the terrorists, but it's always occurred to me that if I do number 21, then I obviously have to go all the way to 30. So I kind of have to be, <laughs> I kind of have to be, you know, 
really into this to uh, to jump on that again because uh, yeah, and th those were quick, easy, short little videos. They were nice, but um, yeah, I, I kind of present the same similar information. I just do it in different ways. So I kind of jump around. You know, I'll do the boom boom room. I'll do a slama size me. I'm presenting the same kind of information that I want to present, but yeah, I, I do it in in different ways. But I thought now, what's the name of that series you did a while back that were they were done professionally? I think somebody. Hmm. You know, somebody else filmed it. You were you were sort of suited up. Yeah, that was just clean shaven. What that was, was that just called? called that was just called answering Islam. Oh, okay. I thought yeah. that's what he was talking about. No, he but said he said Islamic, Islamic. facts, fun, yeah. and so he just left out the fun. So I, okay. I I I put the fun in Islamic facts, and that's when you end up with fun Islamic facts. And I think t two of those were actually taken down for totally nonsensical reasons. Like the, like like the first one was taken down. It was just called. I think it was titled Muhammad pees like a girl. And that's a that's a direct quote. <laughs> the pagans made fun of him and said, "Look, you pee like a girl cuz cuz he made all his he made himself he himself and all his followers uh peed while Squat. squatting." And I, I I you know, I get for, you know, sanitary reasons why someone might want to sit down on the toilet, you know, to prevent, you know, splashing or sprinkles or something like that. That's not what we're talking about. It's not saying he sat down on a toilet. It's saying he squatted down to pee, right? Which uh, matter, <laughs> matter of fact, a, a, a real man outside peeing is peeing for distance. Yeah, so you, I don't you know got what to, or, or to or to or to or to spell something. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it was funny because uh, <laughs> when I posted that, someone uh, someone sent me a comment said that he converted to Islam in high school and he was on the football team and they told him he had to pee while squatting. And so he said, <laughs> he said, so I, so I went behind the bleachers to pee while squatting. I messed up my Nikes. I was so mad. <laughs> That's that's where we got the idea in Islamicize Me, where uh, John pees all over his shoes uh, when he tries to do that. It was an actual true story. Mm. Fun, 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 fun. All right. Uh, now, oh, here's one, Anthony. This is from Jacob Lambert. He says, hi, David. Very quick question. Why is the word for God spelt differently in Greek in John 1.1? When the word God applies to Jesus, it's, and I think he's, this isn't a real transliteration. You know, if you translate, you try to come up with the same, you know, you know, the, the same sounding letter uh, in another language. It looks like, it looks like he's just taking the letters and then going with the English letter that looks most similar, even though like, you know, this would be a, you know, this would be a theta, not uh, an, an O. But we can figure out we can figure out what you're saying. So uh, looks like uh, the, when the word God applies to Jesus, it's theos. That's what it would be. It's theos. But when God applies to the Father, when the word God applies to the Father, it's theon. Why is the spelling different? So Anthony, you can obviously go into more depth on this, but I will just pull. I have the technology. One second. We to have the pull up the Greek and all right, so here you have John one one in Greek, ladies and gentlemen, and so um, yeah, well, let, yeah, let's just go through this. So uh, just reading verse one, N R K. So that's in the beginning, N R K, N R K, and then you have. Um, and then you have Ain, so that's just was, in the beginning, was, and then Ha Lagos. Ha Lagos is the word, right? So we have lots of words that use uh, derivatives of Lagos there. So in the beginning, NRK, Ain was Ha Lagos, the word. Kai, guys, if you want to learn Greek, start with the word Kai. It's like, I think it's like 10%. Have you heard that, Anthony? Isn't it like 10% of words in the Greek New Testament are like Kai? So you can learn like 10% yeah. of the Greek New Testament, something like this, like 9 or 10%. You can learn 9 or 10% of the Greek New Testament just by learning Kai. Right there. It means and. Uh, and halagas. So that's the word again. And the word, ain, again, was. So guys, keep in mind, you can read John 1.1 1, 1, just by learning these few words here because it, it repeats a lot of the same words. And the word was pros tan theon. So, and the word was with God. So that's the objection that Jacob Lambert is saying. God there. So 
the word was with God. So there, clearly referring to God and uses and has a, an, an, an O-N there, or an Omicron nu there, right? Theon, Kai, so that's and, and this they kind of they kind of flip it, which you can do because these you know the subject is identified by the uh, you, you've got halagas there. So and theos ain halagas. So halagas is the subject there, and the word was ain again. So notice here, all you have to learn is ain, kai, um, lagas, theos, and then you've got NRK, and so, and then of course Prostan Theon. So you can basically learn all the Greek here of John one one. So Kai Theos, Ain Halagas. So that's the Halagas. There is the word, and then Ain was, and then God. So um, now. So the, the claim here, Anthony, is, well, theos is the word used to say that the word was God. But then theon, right there, uh, it, it ends with an N. So why are these two, why is God different here? And I'll just give the, the basic rundown. Uh, these, we don't do this in English so much, um, Jacob, but these are, just, these are just case endings depending on how a word is functioning in a Greek sentence because they can put them in different orders, whereas we tend to stick with a with a certain order in English. In other words, we identify the subject and the predicate and so on by the order of the words. In Greek, uh, they add endings to the words to show what they're doing in a sentence. And so, ha logos, that's, 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 a, that's a subject. And then if, you, if, that, if the word theos is going to serve a different role in a sentence if it's the subject then it would be ha theos if it serves a different role like the accusative or as part of a prepos prepositional phrase then it's going to take a different form so that's not talking about different words for god there that's just the same word for god being used in different ways in a greek sentence uh, anthony that's about as good as I can do, having not taken Greek for the past 10 years. But uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that's right. As you said, uh, you know, English word order determines subject, predicate, uh, object of the sentence, that sort of thing. So all that's going on here, it's the same word. Nobody that knows Greek would ever say it's two different words. It's an inflected language. The case endings change depending on how the word's being used in the sentence. So in the, the second clause of John 1, 1, when it says, uh, so in the beginning was the word, when it says, and the word was with God, notice it's the word, the word's the subject, God is the one he was with. So that's uh, in the accusative form. The accusative means it's the object of the sentence, right? But then uh, in the, the last clause of John 1, 1, it says, uh, kai theos ein halagos. So Again, the logos is the subject of the sentence, but now the word theos isn't being used as uh, an accusative, but as a predicate nominative is, is basically the idea, meaning it's stating something about the word. It's using another nominative, uh, another uh, word usually used for the subject, and it, it's stating something about him. And this is actually a special construction in Greek um, you know, you mentioned uh, just by learning the word chi, a person would know at least 10% of the vocabulary of the, of the New Testament. But of course, learning a language, uh, and you know this, but I mean, I'm just saying it for the sake of other, others, knowing a language goes well beyond just, just the vocabulary. It also involves things like syntax uh, and other things related to the construction. So here, so the, even the word chi, for example, can have different nuances. It can mean even in different contexts, mm -hmm. not just and. But here, you have uh, an unusual word order than you would normally expect. This is what's known as a pre-verbal predicate nominative, meaning that uh, the, the predicate here is being stated before the verb. So, I mean, it literally, it doesn't say, and the word was God. It literally says, and God was the word, right? Or, mm -hmm. and God the word was. Uh, or, and God was the word, yeah. So the predicate nominative is before uh, the verb, and that's significant in Greek. And I won't get into all of that, but just, just so the, the 
question or knows. I mean, it just has to do with the rules of Greek. It, uh, it's a different language than English. It's, but, but the two words there that you see, the two forms, are just the same word. And it's just because they're being used differently in the sentence as far as, not, not differently in meaning, but different in uh, grammatically, meaning they're, they're functioning differently. One is subject, one is predicate nominative, that sort of thing. Yeah, so uh, so Jacob, we 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 do this in English with uh, you know singular and plural. We'll we'll change the the form of the word or add an s. We'll we'll change the word. Um, but yeah, in in not only Greek, uh, Latin as well, and I'm sure many other languages. Yeah, they they start changing the form of the word depending on what it's doing in a sentence. So hope that helps. And. Let's take one more here from uh, from Patreon. This is one for you, Anthony. He says, I've seen a man at work going toward Christ, and of course he has critics for being outspoken about it. I joined with him and I shared what I learned on your videos. It deepened his faith, but one of his critics, who simply shuts him down by saying it's just some old religion no different than any other, he replied that only Christ gives you the truth and offers a way, a uh, better morality. His critics perked up at that. Anyway, okay, so someone responded to the man and said, Christianity is just some old religion, no different from any other. And then the man replied, uh, no, only Christ gives you the truth and offers a better morality. His critics perked up at that and told him he should not judge as Jesus Christ said not to. How would you answer to someone so flippantly putting out don't judge as a way to shut us down? So just to, to recap here, um, people are making fun of him saying, hey, Christianity is no different from anything else. And he's saying, wait a minute, look at Jesus, clearly a better morality than you have in other religions. Like Jesus is clearly better than Muhammad and so on. And then his critics said, ah, but now you're judging. And Jesus said, don't judge. What are your thoughts on that, Anthony? Are you ready to leave Christianity because you've been refuted? Um, you can't judge. Yeah, so in context, Jesus is condemning hypocritical judgment, right? Uh, if a person would read the entirety of it, he'd uh, see that. This this is something that you hear from unbelievers all the time. Uh, one of the first things that one, anyone should make, uh, one of the first observations anyone should make is when people say this, what are they doing? Right. When they say you're wrong for judging me or, you know, even if they state it elliptically. Right. It's, uh, you know, uh, Jesus said, don't judge. They're condemning you for the act of judgment. So they're doing the very thing they're claiming. Jesus said you can't do. Rather, what Jesus said is he says, do not judge. So you'll not be judged for in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, here's the important line, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So what Jesus is saying here is something that uh, I think is, is obvious and unobjectionable, uh, that people who are guilty of doing something probably shouldn't go around pointing their fingers, uh, you know, at other people, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If you're a murderer, then <laughs> you probably shouldn't be going around condemning people for being murderers. Mm -hmm. um, if you are, uh, let's say that you're a person, you claim to be a prophet, you engage in immoral acts, right? You take the wife of your own adopted son, uh, you bed your best friend's nine-year-old daughter, you do things like that, you're probably not the best person to go around telling people about morality. First take the huge, you know, boat, uh, you know, the, the huge forest out of your eye before you turn around and tell other people what's right or wrong. That, that's what Jesus is talking about. And we know that's what he's talking about because in the same chapter, by the way, uh, he also says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. So he's telling people that they are able to evaluate whether somebody's a true or false prophet based on their fruits, based on their, their words and actions. And that involves making judgments. 
Moreover, in John 7, verse 24, Jesus said, Do not judge according to outward appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Right? So Jesus, again, endorses righteous judgment, not hypocritical judgment, and in fact calls his followers to, uh, you know, evaluate the fruit, especially of those who claim to be prophets and aren't. Mm -hmm. All right, and here is a uh, different question for you, Anthony. Proud Saracen said, Is believing the Trinity essential to Christianity? There are Unitarian Christians. I also notice that Trinity seems to have different views among Christians. So, get yourself into some trouble here, Anthony. That's why we roll. <laughs> me, me, ladies and gentlemen, I just sit back and listen. If... Uh, I can neither confirm nor deny anything uh, Anthony says here, but go ahead, Anthony. <laughs> yeah, I would say the Trinity is absolutely essential, first of all, to Christianity, what Christianity is, right? Set aside for a second a, uh, the individual's faith or not, right, in the Trinity. In terms of what Christianity is, it is Trinitarian to the core. Everything Christian flows from or coheres with the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, that's why it's not surprising when you look at every single anti-Trinitarian group on the planet, they all have not just a different view of God, but a different view of every other doctrine, or, or at least the major doctrines of Christianity, uh, right? So so just, just think about the nature of God, for example. Uh, the, the contemporary biblical Unitarian movement, so-called biblical Unitarian movement, which comes from the Socinianism of the 16th, uh, 16th century, uh, they reject not just that uh, God is triune, they also reject that God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in the biblical sense, right? They all think of God as somehow a body, uh, an embodied being, right? He's not infinite. He's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient, right? The same thing is true of Jehovah's Witnesses. Because remember, part of the reason for rejecting the Trinity is because it goes beyond their comprehension and to their minds, any being like that, that isn't fully, uh, you know, isn't a being that can be fully uh, encapsulated by their thinking, doesn't fit into their experience, anything like that has to be rejected. So historically, those who reject the Trinity have also rejected things like the infinity of God, his omniscience. Uh, they also reject the doctrine, uh, well, of course, of the incarnation, right? They don't believe Christ is the Son incarnate. So they also have a very different view of the atonement. The atonement can't be itself sufficient to take away the sins of, of men and guarantee a right standing with God and give man a title to eternal life, right? It can't be that sort of thing because, again, you're just talking about the death of a mere man. How could a mere man accomplish such a feat with God? And so as just par for the course, they end up rejecting the sufficiency of Christ's atonement. They also reject that it's a penal substitutionary atonement, uh, and so end up having a gospel of works righteousness. Uh, I mean, on and on we could go. It, it changes everything about Christianity if you tinker with the doctrine of God. I mean, just think about salvation. Salvation is described in Scripture as a work of all three persons, right? It's the Father who uh, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son— the Father is presented as planning salvation, planning redemption, sending the Son into the world, being with the Son, right? Jesus said, the Father is always with me. So uh, the Father uh, is the one who sends, the Son is the one who comes, the Son dies, but then the Spirit is sent by Father and Son to apply the benefits of Christ. Jesus said, the Spirit will take of mine and make it known to you. The Spirit's the one who illuminates the mind, opens the heart, uh, gives faith, works faith in the heart, grants repentance, unites people to Christ, baptizes us into Christ. That's why we our prayers, something as fundamental in Christianity as prayer, is to the Father, through the Son, in or by means of the Spirit. Uh, the Church itself is said to be that body uh, that has one faith, uh, I mean one Lord, wait, one Spirit, one Lord, one, ba uh, one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. My paraphrase of Ephesians 4 there. Uh, but Christians are baptized. The, the fundamental introductory rite into Christianity is baptism into the triune name of God. Uh, believers are blessed. The benedictions in Scripture, they're, they're blessed in the name of the triune God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, 2 Corinthians 13. 
I mean, on and on it could go. Christianity is Trinitarian to the core. So, uh, yes, that's a fundamental article of Christianity, and it's and that's the confession of the Church. Somebody's free to go off and start their own movement. You shouldn't call it Christian. You can call it whatever you like, but uh, in terms of what the Church has always believed following Scripture, the Trinity is absolutely essential. And you can see that, by the way, in the Athanasian Creed, right? The Athanasian Creed... Uh, states that, uh, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity is necessary to salvation, not just to the true definition of what uh, the Christian faith is. And the, the basis for this is manifold. In the first place, Scripture says we have to believe in the true God, right? It, it's not as if, you know, Muslims sometimes make this stupid mistake of saying, well, we believe in one God, you believe in one God, and therefore we have the same God. Right? There's only one God, therefore we must believe in the same God. Well, if I say I only have, uh, you know, there's only one person in my other person in my city, and somebody else says there's one only one one other person in my city, but we're talking about two different people, then it, it's not the same claim just because just because we both say there's only one of them, right? Um, I could be talking about John Doe, and somebody else could be talking about Joe Smith. Well, in the Bible. The, the Bible clearly distinguishes the true God from what other people call God, right? It condemns the worship of other gods like Baal, Chemosh, Dagon, Molech, on and on down the list. It doesn't pretend that just because somebody believes in a God, then it's the same God just by a, a different name, right? It, it's not like, um, you, know, uh, you know, pick your own name here, uh, the true God is as he has revealed himself in Scripture, and any other God, believing in any other God, is identified as idolatry. Moreover, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 24, he said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So Jesus makes belief in him as deity, uh, he makes forgiveness of sins contingent on believing in him as deity. Right, I am there. Ego emi is an echo of how God identifies Himself throughout the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32:39, God says, "See now that I am, and there is no God besides me." In Greek, that's ego emi, the same expression that Jesus uses in John 8:24. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Uh, the, the same point is made by the Apostle John in 1 John. When he said, anyone who denies the Son, and here you have to remember the context of 1 John, because so many people like to rip this out of context. John has identified Jesus as the Son of God come in the flesh. In other words, the incarnation. Anyone who rejects that Jesus is the Son in that sense, the one who became flesh, so existed with the Father prior to becoming a human being, Anyone who rejects Jesus as the pre-temporal, eternal Son of God is, John said, an antichrist. And he says anybody who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. So that's just a quick take on that. Uh, it's, it's fundamental to Christianity and Scripture. Now, now I would say this, okay, I should add, with, I should add this. That doesn't mean that anybody who becomes a Christian or to say they're a Christian, they have to have... They have to be able to perfectly articulate that. I'm not suggesting anything of the sort. Uh, I'm not suggesting that they have anything less than a very basic understanding of uh, the God who they know, the God who saved them, as somehow Father, Son, and Spirit, right? Personally, right? Each, each is a person. But wh whether they can give a sophisticated, philosophical, theological explanation of that, I wouldn't suggest that for a moment. But I would say that they would be growing in their understanding, and they sure, certainly wouldn't reject that, right, as it, uh, when it's proclaimed to them. All right. Crowd Saracen. And oh, we got this right here. H. Adamson said, this is keeping me awake, and it's 2 a.m. Should have listened to Sam instead. Now you're <laughs> learning. You want to stay awake? You listen to uh, my live streams. You want to go to sleep? You listen to Sam's live streams. So, spot on there. Uh, let's see. Sam the Sandman Shamoon. <laughs> Sam, oh, I'm going to start using that. <laughs> Sam, Sandman 
Sandman Shamoon. That's kind of a tongue twister. Uh, Talitha Kumi said, Anthony Rogers, are you David's sensei in origami? Yeah, so Talitha Kumi here is recognizing that the level of genius on display in this whole uh, affair with the origami stuff and eBay and all of that, she recognizes that you couldn't possibly be behind all of that. It's got to be me. And I, I recognize uh, her insight there. there. There's definitely, she's onto something. But no, I, I, I'm being facetious. So is she. But I would say that my family has been sitting here watching that with great uh, glee. Uh, we've been getting quite a number of good laughs as a family just watching uh, uh, the Dizzle uh, talk about his his art and uh, <laughs> I, I, a new hat, a new hat every time. By the way, I do have fun. I do have fun. <laughs> and what's weird? What's weird is I think of this stuff when someone's when someone's being a jerk, that's right. Someone's being a jerk, then bam, Islamicize me, hits me, right? Someone's being a jerk, and then, hey, Muhammad's boom, boom, room. Someone, Someone's being a jerk, and then, hey, I'm going to fold up your book. Uh, but uh, let's see here. Christian Knight said, what happened to the eBay origami mystery bago? Yeah, so eBay took down the auction. You know what sucks? I made the video. I made the video and I didn't check because they said, oh, you can't have it because it's a mystery and you can't have mystery products because you're not telling people what they're going to win. And when I did, I said it's a it said it's an, you know, an original piece of origami artwork and so on. But then people started messaging me right after I posted my video going, what are you talking about? There's all kinds of mystery packages all over eBay. It's a thing, right? People post mystery packages. So you can type in, you can go to eBay, look up mystery bag. And it's an endless, it's an endless list of mystery packages, mystery bags, and so on. You type in mystery box, a ton of mystery boxes will pop up. So there's there are clearly people at eBay who are just targeting my merchandise for some reason. I don't know why. I mean, look, what what could be what could be less offensive than this? I I don't even know. Like, my goodness, if someone wants to buy this, why would why would eBay stop it? I don't I don't know why. You, you know it. what they were you know what they were doing they were hmm. sitting there pooling their collective you know intelligences uh trying to figure out how can we block this guy you know <laughs> they were thinking that from day one right uh -huh. and this was the best they could come yeah. up with they had they had to say well we better go with something at this point because none of you idiots are coming up with anything that we can use so uh, let's just use this one. Yeah, so that's why it's funny because now I modified it so that I did clearly identify what's in the box this time. And so I'm just going to keep modifying until they just kick me off the entire platform and so on. But by that time, they have viol they have they have broken so many uh, third party contracts that uh, I'm going to have a lot of fun. And uh, so, yeah, mm. we're seeing what's going on here. All right. Uh, Testament Faith said. How can I fully determine that the Gospels were not developed to make Jesus more than he is? So there was a Jesus, and then you have Jesus written about in the Gospels. I guess it, you, you could think of it as similar to uh, uh, Plato and Socrates. So there was a historical Socrates. There was a man who went around annoying lots of people and was ultimately sentenced to death. But no one thinks that the Socrates we read about in, let's say, the Republic was the actual Socrates. He became a character. He became a character in Plato's writings. So I guess the idea here, Anthony, is how do we know that Jesus doesn't just become a kind of character who's embellished and who's who's kind of shaped by the later writers? Yeah, well, so first of all, since you mentioned later, uh, one thing I would observe is that the Gospels are all very early, right? They're, now, you have some people because of theological and philosophical presuppositions, try and make them later than they actually are. And actually, they've had a, a pretty difficult time uh, as the years have gone on because, you know, more and more evidence keeps popping up that pushes the, the, the you know, even for liberal scholars, pushes back how, how late they can date them, right? Like some scholars used to say that John's gospel was written in the second century, right? But, but, evidence kept coming to light that kept forcing them to go further and further back. And you'll notice that w with liberal scholars, they're always trying to get to the, the very end of possibility, right? So let's say we have a bit of evidence that kind of forces us to say, well, it must have been written before AD, AD 100, right? 
So liberal scholars will say, okay, so it was at the end of the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but all that, all that evidence shows is just that it couldn't have been written after that. So why do they constantly say it has to have been written, written at the, the latest possible date that the external evidence will allow? Remember, the Gospels themselves present themselves as if they were written earlier, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is really significant, and, and because the, the Gospel writers aren't writing their books trying to counter 20th or 21st century objections, right? John's not trying to say, oh, I'm going to try and make it look like I've written this earlier so that 21st century critics who say it was written in the second century will think it was written in the first. John's just writing a gospel, and he's publishing it in his day when people are going to be able to say, why are you writing like this? We, we know you didn't write this uh, 20 years ago. You just wrote this, right? But so when you look at the gospels, it's very evident that they're writing prior to the destruction of the temple in AD 70, mm -hmm. right? Actually, th this argument can be made quite easily. Think about this, for example. Um, if uh, So the book of Acts ends in AD 62 thereabouts, right? The book of Acts has Paul in prison in Rome, right? So it, basically, as most scholars would say, it, it breaks off here because, uh, you know, Paul's in prison, and uh, so Luke stops writing at that point. Right. Uh, and we don't know what happens with Luke after that. But uh, that's where that's where it basically breaks off. But uh, Acts is actually the second part of a two volume work. Acts Acts is the second part of Luke's uh, account written to Theophilus. So if Acts ends in AD 62, then the book of Luke, which was part one, necessarily predated it. Right. Well, so. Uh, the interesting thing here is that scholar, their own theories actually end up working against them now, because according to most scholars, Luke was uh, Luke and Matthew were both dependent on Mark's gospel, right? So so Mark wrote, and then Matthew and Luke come along, and they use Mark as well as this other source called Q, for which we have no documentary evidence. Nobody ever mentioned it either uh, in the early church, uh, but they have this postulated document called Q that Matthew and Luke are both using along with Mark to craft their Gospels. But notice, if Luke is written before AD 70, because it's written before the, the Gospel or the Acts, and if Luke is, is dependent on Mark, then Mark was also written before AD 70, right? And, uh, I mean, I could go on and on with this, but, but the point is, these are early books, mm -hmm. right? And I could argue that for every book of the New Testament. Certainly the writings of Paul are all pre-80-70 because Paul was killed by Nero, uh, who was Roman emperor, before 80-70, right? Uh, Nero killed himself uh, in, was it 80-66 uh, or 64? Uh, 64 or 66. I always get those dates confused. Um, so, so Paul and Peter were both killed under Nero, uh, so obviously Peter's writings had to have been written before the destruction of the temple. Uh, you know, on and on we could go. And that gives you most of the New Testament, by the way, just what I said there. Uh, you've got Mark, Luke, John, the writings of Paul, the writings of Peter. That's most of the New Testament. So in terms of embellishment, that's just really early. And, and most scholars think that you need more time for the kind of embellishment uh, that, that would have to be true in the case of the New Testament, right, to, to really say that they've upgraded Jesus. The other problem is that Paul's writings actually were before the Gospels, right? Mm -hmm. Paul was writing in the 50s, uh, and even before that, uh, you know, if you look at something like Thessalonians or Galatians, but uh, Paul has the highest view of Jesus you could ask for, right? Paul calls Jesus our great God and Savior in Titus 1.13, uh, or 2.13, he calls him, uh, uh, you know, God who is forever praised in Romans 9.5. He says that Christ in Philippians 2, he says, although existing in the very nature or form of God, did not consider the equality that he had with God something to be used to his own advantage, but humbled himself by taking the form of a servant. So if somebody wants to say that uh, the Gospels are embellishing goodness, I don't know how do you em uh, embellish on that, right? <laughs> If Jesus is God, according to the earliest writer, Paul, there really isn't anywhere to go in terms of embellishment, right? And you could add here a bunch of stuff, right, just historically in terms of uh, Jesus dying for sin, uh, right? Uh, 
uh, all the all the essential claims of Christianity that Christ died for on the cross, that he was buried, that he rose again, that he appeared afterwards, that his disciples believed he was alive. Um, all of that can be traced back to within a couple of years of uh, of the events. And uh, one 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 point that I would add is we're familiar with a lot of the objections, the early objections to Christianity, right? Um, even even if you're saying, oh, but you know they're included in the Gospels. Well, yeah, that's because the Gospels are responding, or sometimes responding, or drawing attention to objections in order to refute these objections. Guess what? If they're refuting objections against uh, Jesus and against Christianity, then those objections were around there. So we we have an idea of of the early objections to Christianity. So just by knowing, just by knowing what some uh, opponents of Christianity Christianity we're saying you get an idea of what's going on. So when people accuse, when the religious leaders accuse Jesus of performing miracles by the power of by the power of Satan or the power of Beelzebub or something like that, um, look at what they're admitting, right? If 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 Christians were embellishing and saying, "Hey, we're going to make up stories about Jesus performing miracles," then the response would be like, "What are you talking about? We never saw any of that." Stop lying. He's just a regular guy. What are you talking about? He's a carpenter minding his own business. Shut up. Quit making all these stories up. What are you talking about, right? Instead, it's, okay, so he's performing all kinds of miracles, but he's doing it by the power of the devil. Well, what are they admitting? They're admitting Jesus is known as a miracle worker in his own time. So you have you have things like that. You have things with, uh, you know, with the empty tomb and, and so on. We know an early response was that the disciples stole the body. Well, what are they admitting? They're, admit, they're admitting that the body comes up missing and so on. So just by becoming aware of the objections to Christianity, what you don't find is, no, you guys are making all this stuff up. You find alternative explanations to account for what they all knew was true. And so um, even if you just go with that, you find a lot of reliable information that doesn't sound like the Gospels are just making up this stuff about miracles and so on. Um, let's see. I think I have one more question that you forwarded. Uh, Anthony, it is now 943. I still have a bunch of, there's still a bunch of questions in the chat, a bunch of questions that I uh, pulled up here. I think we should go in a kind of rapid fire mode. I know you like to okay. answer. I know you like to spend fifteen minutes answering each uh, each question. How about we go rapid fire here? Well, as rapid as or as rapid as we can. And for everyone okay. who's watching, uh, I, I'm I'm actually planning to be live twice tomorrow. Um, once should be awesome. Three o'clock p.m. I'm supposed to be live with Sam Shamoon and the apostate prophet talking about how Muhammad violated all of the Ten Commandments. AP just posted a video on that recently. And uh, Sam's been writing on this for years, so I'll probably mostly just be uh, uh, be hosting the, so, this this discussion. So how's that going to work? If Sam puts people to sleep and you keep people awake, what's what's going to happen? That's called that's called a live stream speedball. That uh, <laughs> that's like crossing the streams, right? On Ghostbusters, it's a speedball, man. Go it's like it's like cocaine mixing cocaine and heroin, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sam puts you to sleep, I I wake you up. All right, so. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll be live then. And then uh, me and Adam Coleman, me and Adam Coleman, um, planning at 8 o'clock p.m. to do a live stream talking about woke sports since Sunday is coming up. Woke sports. And I'm doing that because, actually, I haven't asked you, Anthony, but none of my other friends besides Adam even watch sports. Do, do, you, do you watch sports, Anthony? The only sport I like are, or the only sports I like are fighting sports. Okay. So boxing, yeah, I'm not, MMA, I'm not aware kickboxing. of I'm not of MMA. I'm not aware of MMA getting a uh, terribly woke uh, recently. But uh, football has, baseball. I mean, ba basketball has, and so on. And so, um, yep, yeah, yeah. And, so me and so Adam are going like, to go live and talk about sports. I do like hockey a little bit, just because there's fighting in it. <laughs> so Anthony only likes fighting. Do you do, do you watch? Do you watch? Uh, do you watch? You ever watch boxing? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I grew up, that's probably why I like it. I grew up watching it with my dad. Um, so that's back in Tyson, but, Tyson, uh, Tyson days. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I was devastated as a kid when Tyson got beat. Now I know he was a dirtbag, you know, in a lot of ways. But uh, I always liked watching him fight, you know. Yeah. And I'm not saying anything about his character now. I don't really know much about what's going on with him now. He Other seems, than he, he has seems, he seems cool. He seems cooler and more laid back now, yeah. Yeah, I just remember seeing some videos where he was saying some terrible things to women, and I oh, thought, yeah. 
oh man, that you know, but uh, and I know some of it had to do with different periods in his life and all that kind he, of stuff. He, he had a, he had a rough life. He had a he had a yeah. rough life. That's that that's not that doesn't mean it's okay to do bad stuff. Right. But you know, you 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 look back on someone's life and say, wow, you had this really messed up beginning, and here's all this stuff, and then you become champion of the world, and all of a sudden you have the money to do anything you want and get away with anything you 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 do and stuff like that and obviously you end up doing some some uh some bad stuff and then he comes out and he'd converted to islam and starts chomping on uh evander holyfield's ear and uh uh what, what's what's interesting about tyson's you, you you know you, you watch him you watch him now and he, he seems like he seems like deep down he's a he's a he's a pretty nice dude who just has a ton of anger and he's been through a lot of stuff that that mm -hmm. messed him up early on um yeah but yeah he, you know he's fighting in here pretty soon right yeah yeah i've been out. watching some of that yeah. all right so knock folga knock folga says hi anthony here in germany many churches start arguing over the baptismal formula whether we should baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or in the name of Jesus, could you please address this topic from a biblical point of view? Thanks and God bless. Oh, by the way, could you do this as quickly and succinctly as possible? Okay, so there are two ways that this could be an issue. Number one, you had this the, the crazy claim on the part of some people that the baptismal formula in Matthew 28, 19 isn't actually in the originals that's just bogus there's not a single manuscript of matthew 28 that lacks this uh so that objection is is quite easy i have actually on answeringmuslims.com david's blog uh from years ago i have a whole series that i did answering that objection so you could go there and watch that or read that uh the other way that people come at this is to say, well, Jesus says baptize into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in Matthew 28, 19. But when we look at the book of Acts, they always baptize in the name of Jesus. Here, the simple answer is you don't have a single statement in the book of Acts telling you what the apostles said when they baptized. What people mistake is the, the apostles will say to people, like on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and he said, uh, you know, uh, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, right? He's commanding them in the name of Christ to be baptized. He's not telling you what's uttered over the, the person being baptized at the time of baptism, right? At other times it talks about uh, calling upon the name of Christ in baptism, but there it's not talking about what's being said by the baptizer. It's talking about what the person being baptized is doing, calling upon the name of the Lord for salvation, right? So I would just say to pay careful attention to what's going on in, in the book of Acts. There, it's not at all at odds with what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19. All right. So those were questions that were sent to Anthony. And I, I we already went through the questions that were sent to me on Patreon. Now we have a bunch of that were from channel members. Some of them are quick, some of them are a little longer. Let's try and uh, just get through as many as we can and uh, we'll, we'll uh, if we have time, we'll take some more questions from the chat. All right, here's the two-parter. Get ready to get burned up, Anthony, because again, I didn't send you this ahead of time. So hi, David. By David, he means Anthony. I have a couple of <laughs> theological questions which I recently encountered. One, why is Boaz mentioned in Jesus' ancestral line, Anthony? Because he was a kinsman redeemer for Ruth's actual husband. And so through Jewish law, one of these other guys should have been present there because he was supposed to carry the deceased person's line forward. Do you have any thoughts on that or would you need to uh, do some research on it? Well, there might be more than what I'm going to say, mm -hmm. right, as far as an answer. Yeah, I can but... think of a couple. I can think of a couple things that would be relevant, but go ahead. Yeah, but my quick answer would be he's still the biological progenitor of mm -hmm. Jesus and therefore legitimate to, to mention. Uh, so that would be my quick answer. Mm -hmm. um, all right. And so that would be that would be the uh, we could just go with that one. Um, now, this one's actually more interesting here, although he doesn't explain doesn't explain where he's going with this. He goes also in John chapter 10. 34 to 39, famous passage. We came across something that we didn't quite understand. Could you or Anthony please explain it to us? Now, this is a this is a passage that, I mean, 
This passage was thrown at me by five percenters in prison, right? You are mm. God. You are gods, right? Five percenters believe that they're that they're actually uh, mm -hmm. gods. Uh, so let me go ahead and read the passage. Um, be, so you just reminded uh, me. I'm trying to. I just heard the other day that somebody was a five percenter that I didn't know yeah. was a five, and I can't remember now who it is. Um, so let me let me uh, let me back up in the passage a little bit. So this is right after Jesus says, "I and the Father are one." So Jesus says, "I and the Father are one." And it says, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. So they understood this as blasphemy. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. So this is all, this is all powerful stuff here. The, the Jews are saying, Based on what you're saying, we know that you're claiming to be God. And so we got a prop we got a problem here and we wanna we wanna execute you. All right, so then we get to the relevant passage. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? You are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. So the, the, the question here, ladies and gentlemen, is, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. He's been claiming to be the Son, but when, when he says that he's the Son of God, he clearly means it in uh, in a very, it, it, it's, it's not in the same sense that I'm a Son of God, right? He's claiming that he's the one who raises the dead at the resurrection. Um, he claims that he's the final judge. So he's claiming this in a divine sense. So people point out saying, you know, they pointed out elsewhere, you're, you're, you're making yourself equal with God. You're claiming to be God. What's going on here? We want to stone you to death for blasphemy. But then in response, Jesus said, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. So Jesus is saying, wait a minute, people, people in the old Testament are called gods. So what's going on? Here? What's going on here now? So he uses that as an objection. And so the question is how we how we understand this, uh, Anthony. Let me just give you my understanding, and it's basically the same the same thing I said when five percenters brought this up. Uh, you're talking back in the 1990s when I was when I was locked up. Um, in in the Old Testament, the word Elohim. You could correct me on any of this, Anthony. The word Elohim doesn't simply refer to the one true God. Right? Yahweh is the one true God, but Elohim can refer to the one true God, can refer to false gods, can be used of angels, can even be used of human judges. And so what Jesus is saying, what Jesus is saying here on, on the way I have, I have understood this, um, Jesus is saying, look, just because someone says this, you, 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 you shouldn't be accusing him of blasphemy. The question is, is it true? And is this actually from God? If this is actually a title from God, you shouldn't be saying, hey, we're going to go out and, and kill you for it. If so, then what would you do in the Old Testament when, when Jesus calls calls human, I mean, when, when Yahweh calls human rulers Elohim? So <coughs> if, if he called them Elohim, you can't just say, oh, if someone has some sort of title that sounds divine, therefore we execute the person. You can't say that. You can't say that. The question is, are, are they claiming that for them, simply claiming that for themselves? Or is that actually, does that have some divine backing to it? And so I think what Jesus is doing there, he's saying, look, yes, I'm calling myself son of God. But the, you can't say we're going to kill you just for saying this. Uh, you, people are called sons of God in the Old Testament too. You can't you can't just say, hey, because I'm making this claim about making these claims about myself, we're going to execute you. You should be examining to see whether they're true or not, and whether this actually comes from the Father. That's what you should be looking at. So it looks like to me, it looks like he's just blocking this blocking this claim. Hey, you've used this title of yourself, or you've you've used this divine title for yourself. Therefore, we execute you. Um, Looks to me like he's just blocking that objection, saying, wait a minute, you can't do that. According to the Old Testament, which you guys say you believe in, you can't execute me for this. You should be ex you should be examining what I mean by this and if it's true. That was my that's been my understanding. What do you think? Yeah, so some of this just builds on that. Uh, 
if you look at Psalm 82, there are some that would try and take this differently, but the standard view is that Psalm 82 is being addressed to earthly judges. God is condemning these judges for judging unrighteously, right? They're not defending the widow, the orphan, uh, and so forth. But it begins by saying God takes his stand in his own in, in the congregation of God or in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. So the picture is there's God in his assembly and there are all these judges around him. He's there for the sake of, of, of judgment, right? And it goes on to say, uh, you know, I've said you are gods and all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any one of the princes. Uh, so the 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 picture is one of judgment. There's these wicked judges whom he calls gods, but they're not judging righteously, so God is judging them for this, right? So now, putting this together with John 10, it's actually beautiful. Uh, In John 10, guess what's happening? Here you have the religious leaders, the rulers, encircling Jesus, right? Remember Psalm 82. God is in the midst of the gods. The gods are surrounding him, these judges, right? But verse uh, 22 says, Uh, Jesus was at the Feast of Dedication, Uh, 23 says it was winter, 24 says the Jews gathered around him, and in the Greek it's literally they encircled him, right? So they're they're all surrounding him. So here you have Jesus in the midst of these rulers, right? And what are they doing? They're passing unrighteous judgment on him, right? The the points that you were just making. So then Jesus makes this observation. He says, uh, even in the Psalms, it says, you are gods. That would already be offensive to them, right? Mm-hmm. Because remember what the Psalm says, that they're going to die like men, <laughs> right? So even quoting this would trigger in their minds, hey, he's associating us with those evil judges, right? Um, but but notice this. There, there's something profound here. Remember John's Gospel. John's Gospel has begun by saying that Jesus is the Word of God, the eternal Word, who became flesh. Notice why Jesus says they could be called gods, these judges. He says he called them gods to whom the Word of God came. Right. So, so they're gods because of this, on, on this account. They had the Word of God. They had authority from God. They ruled uh, by God's uh, authority, His command, His Word, right? This is what put them in their positions of authority, right? But notice the difference that Jesus is setting up here between himself and them. He says, uh, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, what do you say of him whom the Father set apart and sent into the world? Right, you see the difference, right? The, the, here's these men who are called gods because the word came to them, but Jesus is saying, I'm the one whom the Father set apart and sent into the world. Right? I'm not a man to whom the word of God came. I am the word of God who came to men. Right. So if essentially what Jesus is doing here is making an argument from the lesser to the greater. If they could be called gods to whom the word of God came, how much more can I be called the son of God? Since I am, after all, the one who was with the Father and sent by the Father into the world. And, and one thing I would point out here that just makes this very simple, right? Even if somebody doesn't follow all of that, right? Notice that their objection at the beginning is that Jesus was claiming to be God, so they wanted to kill him, verse 31. After Jesus goes through this little theological, exegetical lesson, notice what the conclusion is at the end. They don't say, oh, well, we we misunderstood you, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. No, they say, it says that they tried to seize him, right? They they tried to grab him again. They wanted to kill him. So uh, Jesus doesn't deny it. They don't take him as denying what he just said. They they Mm -hmm. take him as having reaffirmed it. And so they still want to kill him. Um, <laughs> Gerard Perry said, uh, Allah, arm, leg, leg, arm, head. <laughs> well, so, yeah. Do, do, have you, do, do you know what he's talking about? That's what five percenters say. They say Allah actually stands for uh, Allah, uh, A-L-L-A-H, arm, leg, leg, arm, head. <laughs> right. Huh. And so it's referring to man. And so they're gods. So they're Allah. <laughs> oh, pretty cool. Uh, Black Angel said, it looks like we're in the same room. Yeah, I didn't realize until uh, until you said it that it actually does. If my arm were not cut off right there in the middle, it uh, would actually look like we're in the same room. Uh, Munjir Ibn Habib uh, said, I visited this channel and I got some good basics of business. You sure did. You sure did. I mean, everywhere, everywhere, I, everywhere I reach, it just stacks of cash now, thanks to 
whoo, Muslim apologist. You know, I'm curious, what is going on with those guys? Because hijab's <laughs> channel, I know that he got, his one video got taken down because of harassment, mm -hmm. but was he put on timeout? Did did YouTube? Well, no. Then he posted a video on kids or something. I haven't seen. Yeah, any but he he was he was he was off for a while, so I'm sure he got some sort of a penalty. Um, I don't pay too much attention to it, except but people people constantly telling me what's what's going on, and if I'm posting a video, then I'll I'll kind of look up what's going on. But yeah, look yeah. like he got look like he got got a strike for for a little while. But, but then he posted a video, but I, I was wondering if maybe he's, um, you know, being scolded by his uh, his betters. Yeah, obviously. Uh, so so he's got two issues. One, people are jumping all over him, and, you know, he's supposed to be the, the golden boy, not in the golden showers perverted sense that he always talks about, but just, you know, like this is the, this is the future of, of apologetics and so on. And so he has to try to be on good terms with with people on the other hand his pride just won't let him just won't let him uh do that for very long and so uh well what did sun tzu say in the art of war <laughs> if he is of a choleric temper seek to irritate him <laughs> uh all right um I guess we started about 10 minutes late because of Anthony's technical problems. Um, so let's go ahead and... Oh, you're actually going live after this, aren't you, Anthony? Yeah, 10.30. 10.30. So everyone who wants to continue... What are you talking about, by the way? Let everyone know. I'm going to start a series on Messianic prophecy. That's actually a good and interesting one. So those of you who are interested in a live stream on, a live stream on Messianic prophecy, um, at right after this, uh, so 10.30, Anthony's going to be going live and... You, we don't know a lot, but we know it's going to be way more interesting than Sam Shamoon's live stream. So just keep that in mind. All right, let's zoom through a couple more real quick. Uh, Hexata said, can you give an update on how Manny is doing? Uh, yeah, Manny has been, he's basically improved nonstop. He still has trouble speaking, but he's walking on his own now. You know, sort of, he's basically having to learn to do everything over again. Uh, so he's been doing really well. It sucks because uh, the place has been on lockdown because of coronavirus, so no one could come and uh, you know see him and hang out with him and stuff like that. But I believe he's uh, he's about to. Um, my, my one of my other brothers, Matt, is about to go take him to his house in uh, in Massachusetts since Manny can can perform the necessary functions himself now, right? He doesn't need, he can eat himself, he can eat for himself, he can walk around for himself. He's having trouble speaking, but uh, he can basically. He doesn't need to be in a uh, in a in a facility anymore, so he'll be going home here uh, pretty soon. And uh, once he's once he's once he's at Matt's house, I'll probably go up for a visit and uh, record a video to record, give everyone an update like that. Um, hi, Darius here from Ireland. I would like to know where I can get a PowerPoint presentation which shows differences in the Quran, 1924, and old mushafs like Husseini or top copy. So basically, you're looking for the difference between the Hafs Quran and other versions uh, but you say you're looking for a powerpoint i'm not sure where you can get a powerpoint i know that abdullah gondal or gondal i'm not sure how to pronounce it but abdullah gondal he's been on the apostate prophets matter of fact no i can get you you can get this right now if you look up the apostate prophets interview with abdullah gondal abdullah gondal had a powerpoint he's not using a bunch of versions but he's comparing the hafs and warsh and showing different arabic uh d different arabic words and so on in those two versions, but I believe he made his PowerPoint available. So that won't be everything you're looking for, Daro, but that will be a good part of it. I'm not I'm not aware of anyone who just says, "Hey, here's a PowerPoint with all of the uh, with all of the differences," because that would be a lot. I mean, I think they're up to like ninety thousand. They've been counting uh, in the different uh, in the different modern versions. So that notice that's not that's not talking about ancient manuscripts even. That's talking about Qurans that that are still around today. If you want to toss in, you know, manuscripts, yeah, that's going to be a lot. Um, Dimitri Forrest Wood Russian says, "Hi, David. Have you heard about? Have you heard about this, Anthony? Have you heard about Vissarion, a fake Jesus from Siberia slash Russia, who was prisoned two days ago? All, all I saw was that a fake Jesus got locked up. That's uh, that's the extent of what I know. Have you heard about this? No, I haven't. Yeah, so I saw someone posted a video on on a fake Jesus getting locked up." Uh, so he says he is like Muhammad, fake prophet, Messiah, 
Uh, he also founded his community far away from his hometown. He has several wives. He created dietary restrictions and medical practices in his Ummah. And he also has the Book of Revelations, the Last Testament. And he has no miracles. Shocker. And he also used his status for his own purpose. Why all of the why all of fake prophets look so similar? Uh, P.S. Why didn't you celebrate your 500,000 followers? Well, yeah, I'm I'm actually just I am going to celebrate my 500,000 uh, subscribers. I'm just a little behind, so I already had a celebration mapped out. It's just something that I have to set aside a a day or two for. So we just haven't reached it yet, even though I'm like five. I don't know, 520 something now. I don't know. Behind uh, on the celebration, behind getting started today. I'm way, I'm way behind, behind. on everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm terrible. <laughs> uh, Sarah Rainey said, my daughter recently turned five. All right. You're going to have to keep this. You're going to have to keep this short, Anthony, but you're the, you're the better one on this. Sarah says, my daughter recently turned five. Any insight you've gained from teaching your family about Christianity would be good to hear. I know that when I visited Anthony, I was like, gosh, he's doing a way better job here than I am. I think I'm doing a way better job on teaching my kids to kick the crap out of people in a dangerous situation, to smash bullies, things like that. But I mean, my family is just a massive part of like, whatever happens, stay away from drugs. Because that's like trying to end, trying to end that just years i mean these these what are called generational sins of alcoholism and drug abuse and so on trying to that's like like 80 percent of my energy as <laughs> as a parent is trying to keep people away from uh certain uh certain things that have been destroying my family for a long time but when i go and i visit anthony i'm like wow what an awesome cool cool christian family going on here so how do you do it anthony well one thing is so one of the ancient disciplines that Christians used to practice, you mentioned some others before, was catechizing. And it that seems like a bad word to a lot of people because they're, yep. they're used to associating it with certain Christian groups. But it's a biblical concept. If you look at Deuteronomy 6, for example, the Shema, Shema Yisrael, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then it says uh, to teach these things to your children, right? Talk about them when you're walking along the way, uh, when you rise up, when you sit down. These are just to be part of your normal conversation. You're talking about the things of God. You're talking about the Bible. You're reading the Bible. Uh, this is just, it permeates your life, right? Um, and But it says you're to talk about these things with your children. Uh, Paul even uses a word in Ephesians 6 when it comes to instructing children from which we get catechize, right? So... Uh, that just basically means teaching them questions and answers, right? Like, uh, uh, for example, you can ask your child, who is God? And, uh, uh, or you could say, uh, you, you could ask your child, who made you? And teach them to say, God made me, right? Something as simple as that. Uh, and then you can say, why did God make me? Uh, or, or why did God make you? And then you teach your child to say, um, he made me for his own glory right or to enjoy him forever or something like that uh these sorts of things i mean you i even so i have uh, actually right here in my drawer i've got these long paragraph type answers that i was uh well i won't pull it out but the uh, I, i've taught my kids like large portions of things knowing they didn't understand half of what it was saying but also knowing that these sorts of things are going to uh, be meaningful to them later. They're going to grow in their understanding of them. It's kind of like if you think of a song, right? There are so many songs I used to sing when I was a kid and I didn't have a clue what I was singing. <laughs> I understood some things, but then later I was like, wait a minute. I didn't realize that's what I was saying. <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it's the same sort of thing. There, uh, you can teach a child something that he may not fully understand until later, but it's that sort of thing that will come back to them, right? It'll it'll sort of rush back into their thinking in moments of need. And this is really important, actually. I'll just say this one point here. Um, you know, it's always better to learn something before you need to know it, because if you have to learn it in the situation, it, you know, it, that's a problem, right? Like, you, you should already know how you should be responding to a situation before you're in the situation, because then you may not be thinking straight, right? Or you may not be able to quickly access the answer or any number of things. So my, one of my pastors that uh, he used to always say, uh, learn these lessons in the light so that when the darkness comes, right, you, you know what to, to do. 
And so I, I would teach your kids all sorts of things, even if you don't think they're there yet to understand them. So, so for example, just real quickly, uh, I could ask any one of my children right now, and I could have asked them this at five years old. If I would have said to my kids, this is a, an actual question and answer that I, I asked them. If I were to ask them, what is God? They would say, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Okay? They all could have said that at five years old. Now, do they know what infinite, eternal, and unchangeable means? They might have an inkling, but how many of us really fully understand that you know, uh, as well? But, uh, but they'll grow in their understanding of it, just like they grow in their understanding of anything else. Right? They don't understand anything as well as we do now. So uh, that's some of what I would say. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Abdul Frahman Kaba said, uh, David, I really want to study apologetics. And I think you mean polemics there. Uh, it's a good place to study. Uh, Abdul, so yeah, get to it. That's what the channels are here for. That's what the website Answering Islam is is there for. And so, uh, yeah, the, fir the first step in being an, uh, an, an apologist is studying. So get to, get to studying. Um, all right couple more rapid fire hopefully anthony doesn't give more 10 minute answers uh <laughs> let's see eugene says long time subscriber long time seeker of truth can you tell me which do not is a good one let's can you tell me which denomination you ascribe to you find the most true which one do you find the most true thank you anthony this does not mean go on a 10 minute dissertation on <laughs> why you're this 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 uh this denomination what denomination well, I'm not going to say it's certainly wouldn't say it's the only true denomination, uh, but I am a Presbyterian by conviction, which means there are certain distinctives that are held by the Presbyterian Church that I think are biblical. The the name itself, Presbyterian, uh, is is right out of the Bible, right? The word uh, presbyteros is used for elders, and that just reflects the fact that the the Church of the New Testament was governed by elders, right? There was no single individual running the church universal mm -hmm. uh and each church was governed by a plurality of elders it was never in the hands of one individual so there were those sorts of checks and balances um and there are other things that go along with being presbyterian but presbyterians are part of the broader protestant evangelical movement and so even though there are these differences i wouldn't say that it that it makes other churches these aren't differences that make baptists not christian right it, it, it we have a different view of church government we have some differences with respect to uh the mode of baptism right like baptists would insist that people have to be immersed presbyterians along with uh well uh the early protestants all the magisterial reformers the eastern church the western church would say that baptism is uh, legitimately done by sprinkling or pouring as a uh, as a as a mode of baptism. Anyways, I don't want to get into all that, but the, there are differences that I think Presbyterianism is right on, but they're not the sort of differences that I think means other groups are not authentically Christian groups. Um, I'd happily go to if there were no Presbyterian churches here in town. If I wasn't a pastor of a Presbyterian uh, in a Presbyterian denomination. I would happily go to some of the local Baptist churches here, the Bible churches here. I wouldn't do that in every place, by the way. When I lived in Vegas, most of the churches were terrible. <laughs> um, it didn't matter what name they had on the doors, right? And there are there are liberal Presbyterian churches that I would never go to um, that aren't part of our denomination. Uh, Anthony, the correct answer was Presbyterian. <laughs> That's all, you, that's all you had to say. Anthony, it's like, hey, Anthony, what time is it? Oh, I'll explain how to build a watch. And ask how to build a watch. That's what time it is. All right? So, yeah. And me, I'm I'm, I'm just non-denominational. So, yeah. Now, notice how I just said non-denominational. I didn't give, like, a dissertation on it. All right, one notice, more. Notice how Dave is going on and on about <laughs> what it means to say non-denominational. and. All right, one more while you're here. And then I had uh, I had 10 more questions pulled up. But we gotta, uh, we got to cut it off. Uh, John Cass said, I would like to hear Anthony's view on today's prophecy. So they're kind of two issues. One, what, are, what, your, what your, uh, your, your view of prophecy today would be, but also this example. He said, we had a preacher who said, the Lord gave me yesterday a word for this morning for Esther. 
So who is Esther? It turns out we don't have an Esther in our church, and there was no Esther in the service either. And he says, to clarify, use the name Esther for the, for the example, since I forgot the name he used. But trust me, it was very weird, and the audio is recorded and available in Dutch. So two things, Anthony. What do you, what do you think about prophecy today? And then I, I assume there's no real issue on this, on, on this particular example. Someone says, I received a revelation for Esther, and there's no Esther around. And, you know, maybe it's for someone's got a cousin named Esther, and he's supposed to bring that to them or something like that. But we'd probably be pretty suspicious of that. But what's your view of uh, prophecy, Anthony? Well, first, it reminds me of an experience I had in prison. We had all kinds of groups coming out to the prison. And there was this one guy that came out and says, I'm, I'm, the Lord is telling me that there's somebody here in cell 50 to 100, somewhere in there that is experiencing a lot of loneliness and depression. <laughs> and I remember thinking, you just described 90% of the people <laughs> in the entire prison, right? Yeah. So I always, I, I, you know, I see a lot of that sort of thing that's just obviously bogus. Um, but my, my view of, this is my quick view, I'm a cessationist, I believed that Revelation in the first century served a temporary purpose while the apostles were inscripturating uh, the account of what Christ had said and did and accomplished and its implications for the church. So Ephesians 2.20 says the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. You lay a foundation once, then you build on top of it. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is God-breathed and given, or is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished for every good work. So Scripture is sufficient to tell us everything we need to know for doctrine and godliness. And essentially, it's the watchword of the Reformation when they said sola scriptura, the Bible alone is the infallible Word of God. Now, yeah, I could go on with that. It, it, you know, I, but I basically don't believe that prophecy was intended to function after the apostolic age. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, we've gone a little over two hours because we did start uh, ten minutes late, thanks to Anthony, and um, <laughs> we're gonna go go ahead and cut it off now. Anthony is starting again here at uh, in about thirteen minutes on. His own channel, the link to his channel is in the description box. So if you want to, and, and uh, if one of you mods want to post the link in the chat, go ahead and post that there. You can follow Anthony over. He's going to be talking about uh, prophecies. So uh, perfect timing on that question about your view of prophecy. All right. So uh, thanks, Anthony, for joining us here. Um, again, ladies and gentlemen, I'm supposed to be going live twice tomorrow. I've been wanting to get this Zucker Knight video out, so hopefully I'll be able to squeeze it in there. Other than that, we have to jump off because I know Anthony's going to have to set up. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Catch you all tomorrow.